Okay, open your Bibles to James. We're in the fifth chapter. Close this thing out here. Maybe by the end of the month. Well, no, it won't be the end of this month. <laughs> Maybe end of next month. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, your paper. <laughs> That's my copy. That's the way I prepare myself. Um, in fact, Marion, I think I left my copy in that room. You'll see it's got marks all over it with my name on it. Any copy would be fine. It, I need to have one. My, it's been my day. You have the, <laughs> those days? OK. This is mine. Uh, I got it. I got it printed out, then I sent it to John. Then I had it on the de my desk, and so before I came, you know, in the afternoon, I'd go down, I'd go over my notes like everybody who teaches, and I push stuff as I feel the Spirit has led me. And so this is, <laughs> this is my copy, okay? And that's why my name's at the top of it. I'm not supposed to give that to you. Thank God I didn't write anything unusual on it. <laughs> uh, I didn't do anything crazy, I guess. I, I kind of looked it over a little bit, but I don't think I did. Uh, so you have James now. And uh, for those who have visit <laughs> are visiting with us by the Internet, why this is just an in-house kind of thing we're doing here with you. You don't have a pastor's copy of his lesson, but they do. But here we are, and it, um, I'll tell you what I found really interesting about this passage in, in my soul. You know, you always, when you, when you have a passage and you're teaching, then somehow or another, the, the Lord always brings, makes it personal with you. And that's what excites me about teaching. I suppose does everybody. That's the part of it. And he shows you something different every time about it. You could teach the same passage over and over, and he'd show you something different. That's, and, and that's kind of exciting because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, um, but when I studied this passage, and I, I, was, I was looking at doing maybe 7 through 11, and I, uh, there was no way I could do that. So I kept it to 7 and 8. Uh, James gives a, a wonderful illustration about patience in long-suffering episodes. When you get into something that is long-suffering, now it doesn't always have to be physical. It could be financial. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of ways to suffer, isn't there? You know, it's not all physical. And, uh, but look, we suffer for one of three reasons. Basically, this in generality, you suffer in your life, you're going to suffer for three reasons, which is not on your paper. So you, if you don't know it, you, it'd be good to add it. If, uh, if you don't, if you know it, then you don't have to because it's common knowledge to you uh, in your spiritual life. But there are three reasons why people suffer in the church. One is undeserved suffering. I, I just write down U.S., Undeserved suffering, that's one. In other words, you didn't do anything to cause it. God did something to cause it. And it's very, and, and when it comes to your life, it's very beneficial to your life and other people around you. Because great ministry, great ministry flows to people through undeserved suffering that your life would probably not touch if it had not been for that suffering. For example, Paul goes to prison. Out of the prison experience comes the book of Philippians. Just to give you an example. And in that prison time that he was there, he touched a group of people he would have never touched had he not been in prison. You know who that was? The Praetorian Guard. That's the elite of the Roman Empire soldier. That was the elite soldiers of the Roman Empire. 
Uh, that's 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 all right. As long as you're not turned off, we're all right. I'm not going to throw you throw you out of the church for that. I can't afford to throw anybody, can I? I mean, I'll throw another person out of here. I got to go home. Um, well, so here is Paul in the, in the book of Philippians, a wonderful little book on this. I mean, Paul writes about undeserved suffering in the book of, of Philippians about ministry. The ministry that flows from undeserved suffering. That's the whole book of Philippians. And, uh, and it, like you go to a doctor's office when you're suffering on something, you go to a doctor's office, you would never go in a million years and you sit next to people you would never sit next to, right? In a million years, if it wasn't for that. And, um, so under, there's undeserved suffering. Then there's divine discipline because you get into sin or get into some kind of, um, obstinate or disobedience uh, rebellion with God and then the, so you get disciplined for it because God loves his children and that's a good thing he disciplines you discipline from the father to a Christian life is a good thing and you should read about it in Hebrews 12 it's a good thing it's not a bad thing although you might think it is when he gets after you trying to get you to confess your sin which we're going to do in a moment and then Self-induced misery, probably the number one problem with most people is just the things they bring on bad choices, right? Just bad choices. You know, you got a credit card, you put, you put bills on the credit card you shouldn't have put on. You should have just left that card alone and trusted God to give you because that's what God does. If he has to, he'll send manna from heaven. You agreed? I mean, he can take care of you. And so self-induced measures, that's just one example. But those three things, and what we're talking about in James 5, 7, and 8 is undeserved suffering, right? So if you wrote those three at the top of your paper, you might circle the U.S. undeserved suffering because that's what we're so talking about. And now I want to come back to where I was. Sometimes when you study, God speaks to your heart in, in really personal ways about a passage. And boy, I mean... I couldn't get past verse 7 and 8 um, because there is so much suffering right now with people connected to my life and my church and my church's life. We really need this study. We really need it. And the people that we're touching, the lives of other people that are going through suffering, like the 10 ladies that went to Claudia's place today, <clears throat> And you guys that go out to to uh, John and uh, Johnny and Shirley, I mean, just think about the people that are there, at least in, in as bad a shape, if not worse. And God don't send you anywhere without a divine purpose in it. And one of the things is touching people's lives that you would never touch in any other way. And um, <clears throat> it's important that our people understand that what James is talking about is being able to embrace undeserved suffering in your life. You didn't do anything to cause it. God has caused it in your life for a good reason. You know, all things work together for good. You always keep that in the background of your mind. In your life, it's all about ministering to God, to you, and out from you to people you would, your life would never touch in any, in other, any other way. I mean, Paul, in, in the in jail, you know? <clears throat> so, uh, anyhow, but so here's how this, the, here's how these two verses read and pay attention to them because they're really, they're really dynamite. <clears throat> therefore, when you see the word therefore in the English Bible, <clears throat> it means why for? When you see the word therefore, you ask why, why is it there? What reason is it? Why for? And so, therefore, when he says, therefore, everything he taught in verses 1 through 6 has now got a, got a point to it. And we've studied 1 through 6. Now he comes to the point. Therefore, therefore, watch this, be patient. 
brethren, he's talking to Christians, talking to believers, those who believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That's the gospel. When you believe it, you get saved. You get saved by grace through faith. In other words, you don't add anything to that. Christ does all the work, and you do all the believing, and then you've got it. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. You see that? I only got two verses, so pay attention to this. All right? Now watch this. Now he's going to give an illustration of a farmer. Hmm? A farmer. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early it. What do you think the it is? Produce. What? Produce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> until it. <laughs> mm -hmm. actually it's not a produce yet is it it's in the soil it's better get the early and latter rains or it won't be much of a produce all right until it gets the early and latter rains the soil that's been planted right <coughs> is looking for a harvest it's going to have to have the early and latter rains to get it now watch what he says. I'm going to read it again because here's his illustration. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient. So that's the second time we've heard this word, and it's the same Greek word. There are different Greek words for the word patient. This is a unique word. It's, it's one of the big boys. It's not the only word. Hubomone is the other big word, but this is one of the big words. And this word, this word that's used here means long suffering, a long suffering, a period, a length of time. Now, look, you can see this here. So I'm not teaching yet. I'm just reading. But I want you to be sure you read what you read. What is the length of time between planting and harvesting in regard to this text? What are we waiting for? Rain, rain. What, what, yeah. What kind of rain? Early, early, early rain, right after you plant it, and the latter rain to, to, before we harvest it. In other words, that last rain that's necessary to put it into its completed state of high productivity. Mm -hmm. Right? That length of time in there, that length of time, that's what we're talking about is where your patience is required. That's where the farmer's patient, patience is required. You know why? Because he can't do anything about it. This is first century. Can't do anything about it. Now, there's a length of time. And there's where you get long suffering. Because it's that waiting period. It it's, it's been planted, but it has been harvested. That's the season. There's a season here. A season to plant, a season to wait, a season to harvest. There's a length of time. And that length of time in wait, waiting is where patience is required. It's not in the early stage. It's not in the latter stage. It's in the in-between stage where it's really required. When you're going through all the testing, in physical, for example, you're going through all the testing, then they start making diagnosis, and then they start, they start options on treating. All of that is in this length of time between when... It started and when it's going to end. Come on. And that requires patience during the long suffering wait. And this is where the great ministry comes. The great ministry doesn't come from the start and it doesn't come from the back. It comes from right here where others see it and they go, like, I don't know how you can do this. I don't know that. I don't know that. 
this is where, when your life is able to touch all kinds of other people, I mean, sometimes you wind up in a doctor's office, they don't know why you're there. <clears throat> they run you through tests, and when you first came in, they thought, oh, well, oh, you got a problem. They run you through tests and look at you and say, I don't know why you're here. Then you say to them, well, I know. And this is where it really gets t intense. It switches from the patient in control to the doctor in control when you say, well, I do. <laughs> You've got a problem. That's why God sent me to you. You, you do understand that. God didn't send me down no office for him to tell me nothing's wrong. <clears throat> I said, well, if it's not me, it's you. So let's sit down and talk. Because this isn't no, this is not a trip for, for no reason. <clears throat> they, they're always ministry. You're always, that's the book of Philippians. If you want a good little read, go back and look at the book of Philippians and see what Paul is talking about in the midst of suffering, of undeserved suffering. There is great ministry out here. Don't miss it. Don't get caught up in some other reason to be there other than what God sent you there to be. That's called undeserved suffering. And so they talk about that. Now look at verse 8. Then we're going to have a word of prayer and get in our study. You too, be patient. It's the same Greek word. How many times has the word patient been used in the English? Three times. So see, you really pay attention to that stuff. I call them what? What do I call those? Markers. markers. Call them markers. When God repeats stuff, you pay attention. A good student always does. There's another thing that's used. Watch this. How many times is the coming of the Lord mentioned? What's verse 8 say? Ah. It's mentioned twice. In two little verses, it's mentioned twice. Those are markers. Those are markers. The same Greek word, makra through myo, is used every time for the word patient that's used in this text. <clears throat> that's a marker. <clears throat> that's a big marker. Because that word means long-suffering. A larger scale than micro, right? Macro, micro. This is macro. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer then. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be sins of the tongue, overt sins, mental attitude sins. Just to give you an example of those. And if you're aware of any of these through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you, then he's going to ask you to confess your sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And what that does is restore you from carnality. It restores you to spirituality, the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that's essential for John 14, 26, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you and recall the word of God. That's very important. I'll give you a moment before we look at the farmer's patience. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. We pray, Father, that they would see the importance of undeserved suffering in the illustration of the farmer's patience in the word used three times in our text, macro through mile. 
I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth in it because I suppose like in all churches, at least in ours, there's a lot of really intense suffering going on in undeserved. And I'm afraid that sometimes we don't realize the great ministry that flows from it for God. Why would God do this? You need to be able to see an ultimate purpose in it. Why did he send his son through it? For other people. For other people, for his life to touch other people for centuries until the second coming. So it would be here with us tonight. In this story, our suffering is associated with the second coming of Christ, the end, the, the latter reign. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> here we are in the farmer's illustration by James out of the first century, talking about patience. And what you have to focus on, I circled <laughs> on your paper, is the length of time. It is in that length of time, it's not in the beginning or the end, but is in that length of time when you're setting in prison in the Philippian prison business that great ministry comes. It's during the heat of the moment where great ministry flows from your life and to your life. It's in the heat of the moment, right? It's in that length spot, and, and James calls that the period of long suffering, the period of long suffering. Great ministry comes out of that. And when we, if, I mean, it's all over the passage, but it's, certainly it's, it's highlighted in, in Jesus' own son going through it. Right? He didn't hang on the cross for his sins. He hung on there for ours, for others, for others, for others. And so it's a great reminder to us. <clears throat> you know, I like Philippians 1.29. Of course, I'm crazy about the book of Philippians anyhow, but it says, you know, it was granted for us not only to believe, but to suffer for his namesake. It's a privilege. It's a great, you know, that word granted is a grace word. In the Greek language, it's a grace word. It's a great moment for the grace of God just to flow in all kinds of directions out of your life to other people. <clears throat> Claudia and Tony and Boyce and Deborah and, and uh, as teams and and uh, Steve uh, Steve um, Calvin Ka Steve Chafin why well, I, I say Steve Calvin uh, so much as unbelievable uh, <clears throat> notice that Paul used the gr Greek word macro uh, through myo rather than hupomoneo. A hupomoneo means to abide under, uh, and it deals more with how you're dealing, personally dealing with it. But long-suffering is, is focused on that period of time when your life has a chance to really touch other people. So don't get so self-absorbed in undeserved suffering. It's a privilege. It's a, it's a factor of grace. You know, when we look at the six stages of grace, one of them is called suffering. Suffering, and uh, and he uses that. Uh, Paul uses that idea. Yeah, James is using it here, and uh, it's talking about lo long suffering in the in a length of time. Now that length of time is up to God, right? That length of time. It is used three times in our text. This word macro through myo is used three times in our text, twice in verse in 7, the first time it's used, and the first time it's used in verse 8, our aorist active imperative, second person plural. Those are strong commands. Those are strong commands. That's a command that flows from the top to the bottom and includes everybody who hears it in that chain of command, all the way from, you know, in our case, the... The head guy would be the president all the way down to the PFC. That's what they mean by a strong command. Uh, Bob used to call it the hut to command. 
uh, it's used that way. And the other time it's used is in the illustration used as a participle, a present participle. Now that's important. <clears throat> it, it will be in a moment. So let's take a look before I get into my study. Let's take a look just at text at the text. The first time the word <clears throat> patience is used in verse seven. You all be patient. Therefore, <clears throat> that's a second person plural. You all, come on, Southerners, you all, <clears throat> you all be patient. That's in verse 7. Then in verse 8, he comes back to it. It's an aorist act of imperative. That's, that's a very strong command. Second person plural. Second person plural. <clears throat> and it means you all, you too all be patient is how this is translated. Notice in verse 8, you too, all, y'all, y'all, be patient. Two commands. But when he gets to the illustration between the two commands, and he gets to the illustration, the farmer illustration, he changes it. Pay attention now. The, he changes from aorist tense, a point in time divorce from time, connected with something in the past to the present tense. It's a present act. It's a present participle. Note the change from the heiress to the present tense from the plural to the singular. Because we're talking about illustration of one farmer. And it's used as an analogy or a comparison. This is, this is a farmer's life. Any, any farmer idea. All right. It's an illustration of the farmer. Now, if you have a participle, let me tell you something about the Greek language. If you have a participle, look up here. If you have a participle, you're looking for a main verb. A participle is a verbal adjective. <clears throat> that's, how it's, that's how it's addressed. It works both as an adjective and a verb. <clears throat> a participle. <laughs> you understand that? It's a verbal adjective. It's always looking for the verb because it's a verbal adjective. It's dressing up the verb so you're <coughs> of whatever the subject is about. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know what's happened here. My throat's got dry. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Does that, everybody cough? <coughs> and we'll be okay. We'll be okay. <laughs> I guess. Now, a participle is a verbal adjective, always looking for a main verb. When it finds the main verb, in this case, we're down at the farmer waits. Look, look at your paper. It's a present middle indicative, third person singular, with the word patience. Present active participle, not the singular masculine. Do you see that? See the word waits and being patient? Now listen to me. Listen to me. The participle is looking for the verb because it wants to have a date. Okay? They're looking for a date. When he finds the date, then this simultaneously works. The present the action of the present participle works simultaneously if the main verb is a present. If it's in the present tense and the participle is in the present tense, then they both work at the same time. One supports the other. The adjective, the participle, is now dressing up, adding something significantly important to the verb connected to the subject. Are you with me? So, so here's what he said. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil being patient. What's he just connected? What are the two words he just connected that must work in harmony? Waiting, right? And what? And being patient. From the time of planting to the time of harvesting is that length of time illustrated. Now, 
during the waiting in the period of long suffering. You're to do what? Be patient. Or, or wait patiently. You know why? Because you can't change anything. You don't have the power to change anything. You don't have the power. You, you were capable, you were the good, listen to me, you were the good soil that got the good seed. You remember the parable? You were the good soil that got the good seed of undeserved suffering. You've got to wait it out until the, what comes out of it? What's going to come out of it? What's going to come out of waiting for the early and latter rain? What's, what's, what's going to come out? Mm -hmm. You missed a word. You missed a word. You missed a word. What, what, what kind of produce? Precious. What kind of produce? Precious. Now, who's that eyes? God's and yours if you do it right. Now, some's that waiting period can really be a struggle. The book of Job proves that. At the end of the book, you see what precious produce produces, don't you? If God, if the end of it is you're still alive and it been brought through it, then there's really blessings come out and it's precious, right? Well, listen, it don't matter what the end is. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's precious. To the Christian, it's always the precious produce. At the end, it's going to, look, at the end, it's going to produce precious produce. So you might as well just grab a hold of that idea while you're going through it. Because God didn't plant it. Oh, come on now. He did not. This is the parable of the sower. He didn't plant it except in good soil. He would have never planted undeserved suffering in your life if it wasn't good soil. And he will bring the early and latter prosperity to the part of the suffering in the end because it will produce precious produce. That's a promise from God. I had to make this up. I couldn't have promised you that in a million years. I don't have that kind of authority and power, but God does. Only one person, he's going to sow it. He's going to bring the early and the latter rains and produce something that's precious. And you've got to believe that. That's a promise God made. And you know he keeps his promises, Romans 4.21. He's going to bring it to pass. He did in Job's life as an example. He did it in Paul's life with a different example. He'll do it in your life with either Job's example or Paul's example or maybe your own example when the rapture comes and you don't experience either life or death. Which is kind of a unique idea, isn't it? But it's going gonna, it's gonna to go, the end is going to go one of three ways. And it don't matter. Because it's going to be pre precious produce. The product's going to be precious. That's a wonderful word. You know, precious is the word to me, and it, and it means of, of great high value. You, you accept that because God says, in my eyes, this is of great high value in the human race. And... Uh, you know, sometimes we go, I hope you don't pick me for it. You should. Listen, you should be, it should be, look, if I'm, look, don't go negative on that idea. Look, if he picks me for that, then I'm the good soil. And I am, out of that is going to come enormous ministry. And it will, enormous, if you don't shut it down. It, the great ministry comes through this period of long suffering is when the great ministry comes out. It's when you touch nurses and doctors and other patients and family members and friends and people in the church that go like, how do you do that? Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called 
How do you do it? It's called the early and latter rains. It's finding the divine blessings in the midst of it. I don't know. A lot of you came off farm country. A lot of you came off farm country. You plant a field. You, 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 you cultivate. You get, a, you get a, a field ready for harvest. I mean, you get a field ready to sow, and you sow it. And he brings that early rain. I tell you, every one of us would leave the house and walk out by the field. That is the best smell in the whole wide world is when the rain hits that field and you know that's the early rain and there's a wonderful smell. I mean, it's, I know my grandfather, he would take me, I was a little boy and we'd walk out there and he said, smell that son. And I would smell it and he said that you will never smell it any other time like this, never. And I'd smell it as a little kid and he said, you know what you smell? And I said, no, sir. He said, you can smell it, though, can't you? And I said, yes, sir, I can. He said, son, that's a, that's a smell of prosperity. That is the smell of prosperity. That early rain, we needed it, and that's the smell of prosperity. When we harvest that rain, and that rain, and there's another time when that corn or whatever you're raising gets at a certain place and you've got to have that last rain to top it off and it comes it gives you that same smell a little different though not the smell of that of that fresh land with water on it there's a smell there that you never forget and when I talk about it, I can still smell it I mean that's amazing there's nothing like that I mean, and, and to a farmer knowing I got my early rain, I got my early rain, I am off to the races. I am off to the races. And so, so the writer, writer makes a, a, James goes to a lot of extent here to establish some principles. Number one, here, here oh, you know, I, I talk about sandwiches all the time, and you can read that on your own. Point number one. James' illustration of the farmer's patient is directed towards three parts. Be patient. Wait. In other words, be patient. He says, be patient. Wait being patient. And then he tells you, in other words, be patient with the whole process. Get your head in the right place. Wait patiently. Wait patiently, the long period. And then understand that God's going to bring it to pass. God's going to complete it. Right? Did he not promise that? There's an early lane and a last rain. We're going to have a planning, we're going to have a waiting, and we're going to have a, pro a produce. Agreed? I mean, God just not have it. Hey, listen, he's not hanging you out to dry. One person said to me one time, well, I, I'm tired of having God hang me out to dry. I said, boy, you've missed this whole idea. Let, let me coach you up a moment. Let me just coach you up a minute, if you don't mind. I mean, God don't, that's not what God does. He didn't hang you up to dry. But I do understand how you can feel that way if you don't have any doctrine in your soul. So a lot of times, you know, when you find people going through suffering, you know, they touch base with and say, would you pray for me? Listen, listen, yeah, let's have a cup of coffee. Oh, yes, I'll pray for you. Let's just have a cup of coffee. And you talk to them, see if they're prepared to be able to handle what's on their plate. Right? I mean, I do that all the time. People go, well, I, well, can you have a cup of coffee? And I say, I mean, can you pray for me? And I'll go, yeah, but can we have a cup of coffee? I mean, you got it, man. Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's, uh, when's the next time you go to the doctor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we have a cup of coffee the day after? I don't know, right? Can I have a cup of coffee? Kind of. This is, the, this is what I tell them. This is where I go. I go to James 5, 7 and 8. This is where I go. Anybody go there, right? Is that a wonderful example of it all? And coach them up. Listen, these people, listen, when they call, somebody calls you and say, would you, ha would you pray for me? You know what they're really asking for? Would you throw a life preserver to me? W would you coach me? Would you, be, would you coach me? Did you coach me? I mean, I mean, listen, sometimes the ministry is in us to them to coach them up and coach them along the way. And 
I'm just saying. I don't know. Now, watch this. I wrote this out the way you ought to see it. Under point one, the farmer waits for what? For the precious produce of the soil. What is that? For the fruit of the long suffering, right? Is that not the payoff, the proof, right? The fruit. How, how, long, how, how to wait? Be impatient about it. The time of produce, right? About that length of time that we have to suffer. Suffering for how long? Until, that's a unique preposition, H-E-O-S. We call it the, an unusual preposition when it's with a subjunctive of possibility or potential until it receives, gets, Lombano, a subjunctive, air sub, subjunctive, it gets the early and latter rains. This is the reason for waiting patiently during the long part. You get the early one. Now everything hits the fan. You're waiting for, the, you're waiting for what? The latter rain, which is a blessing. Divine blessing of planting, divine blessing of the latter rain, because after the latter rain, there's always the early one and the latter rain. The early one, you go like, whoa. And the latter one, mmm. Because when you get the latter one, the corn's up waist high. You get that you get that latter rain and warm nights and corn. I mean, I mean, you can start doing a dance. I mean, you're gonna have a corn harvest. <clears throat> that we raise a lot of corn, obviously. <clears throat> and therefore, it gets the early and latter rains, reason for waiting patience during a long period of suffering is that when you get the latter rain, you're close to harvest, and therefore, that's the precious produce. <laughs> a while back, a guy called me out of Coleman, a friend of mine, and he raises a lot of produce and sells them, you know, produce market guy. <laughs> and he said, I need, to, I need to have a prayer sent up from you uh, for my tomatoes. If I don't get rain, we're not going to have, and, and boy, I don't know if you've ever, Col, Coleman tomatoes is like planting peaches to me. If I want good tomatoes, I'd get them out of Coleman. That's just me. Yeah, I mean, what do I know? But I know a good tomato when I see one or when I taste one. <laughs> and they're definitely like them, are they? When they come out of the soil, oh, that is the best. I mean, they smell good, and you just, Make a sandwich out of them, right? Yeah. Don't put nothing else but tomatoes. Are you from the south? <laughs> <laughs> I am now. Tomato sandwich. Oh boy. I mean, we're start. You can tell I haven't eaten supper yet. <laughs> I would mean, even like a tomato sandwich. <laughs> now, here's what James is trying to tell us: You have been promised. You have been promised a grace result. You got to see grace from the start, in the middle, and in the end, right? It's all about grace. Suffering grace. Suffering grace. You, ha you have been promised a grace result. Not just a planting, but a harvest. The precious produce is what you've been promised. You will receive precious produce. This divine blessing will come as a result of God's early and latter rain or divine blessings in the midst. You know, if it wasn't for that, there would be a lot of despair. But God brings blessings to your life in the beginning to show you that he's got a hold of this deal and he'll bring it back in the end. He'll pop it back in the end. In other words, he's going to show you of, and he's going to make you aware of his presence in the midst of this suffering. That's the early and latter rains. It will come in a time, it will come in time, it will come in time like Job, who lived to see the benefit of the precious produce, agreed? Yeah. Or it will come in eternity, like Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, well worth your read. Or it will come, as James says, with the coming of the Lord, which we call the rapture. So you got three ways that it will come, and it will be precious. Either you'll live through it, 
and come out the other end, or you'll die and come out the other end, or you'll be raptured, and there you go. So, you know, for me to live as Christ and die is gain. And I didn't even know how you approach the rapture with all that, uh, other than uh, it's all wrapped up in a kind of a unique package, isn't it? Uh, here we go, point, point two, or how much time I got, I don't know. In James 5, 8, he compares the early and latter reigns to the second coming of Christ. Agreed? Right. Oh, yeah, he does. Only God can send early and, lat early and late reigns for the precious produce. Deuteronomy 11 talks about it in farmer illustrations. Uh, he will give the rain for your land in its seasons, early and late rain. That divine purpose you may gather in your grain, one, new wine, two, and oil, three, precious produce out of Israel. They're still known for that, by the way. Only God can send Jesus Christ back to earth a second time. Is that not the point, too? Mm -hmm. uh, in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says, But the day no man knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. How about that? Man cannot produce either end. This is why he's commanded twice, you all be patient. Here's my third point. There are two doctrines, and boy, pay attention to this now. Now we're down to grit. There are two doctrines that are commanded for application for waiting patiently during long-term suffering. We have looked at macro through myo. Here's the word sterizo. Sterizo. James 5.8. Watch, look at James 5.8. I wrote down your paper. You too be patient. That's that aorist active imperative. Strengthen, strengthen your heart. That's an aorist active imperative, just like macro through myo. Strengthen your what? Heart. Your heart. You, here's what we would call that. Be encouraged, be courageous. Look above your circumstances to God who is above them all and yet in the midst of them all because of his presence in your life, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you hear the word idea of macro through myo in this passage where both, of the, both these words are used, <clears throat> he, he is referring <clears throat> to the fourth fruit of spirituality ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And this is the word that is used with the fourth fruit. You know, there are nine. This is the fourth macro through myo. Patience. That's the word. So this can be produced in you instantaneously every time it is necessary by you just walking in the power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Agreed? It is. What is a fruit? It's a produce. It's a precious produce. So here's what God has done in this period for us as new, co new covenant believers. We have the Holy Spirit that can produce macro through bio as a, as a fruit in your life, as a produce. A fruit, is a, a fruit is a produce. Orange, apple, <laughs> what, tomato? Is that a fruit? And, uh, even if you put it on that sandwich. I'm not going to, well, we do bananas. I said I'm not going to put other, but we put bananas. I don't, but other do people do. Uh, so uh, Galatians 5.22 um, and in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit. And, and P Paul in Galatians 5.25 says, if we live, Zeo, present active indicative, if we live, that's a first-class condition. If this is true, then the then is true, right? If we live by means of the Holy Spirit, 
then let us walk. Now, this is not peripateo. Notice, stoicheo, this is a word that means to march in step, like in the military, or a band who marches in step, or in the military, right? I mean, if you don't, everything gets screwed up. If one guy doesn't do the cadence, it, then everybody's, you know, one gets out of step, everybody's out of step. Uh, either that or they, in the Army, they just pull you and throw you out of, out of the, <laughs> who, whoever's, in, whoever's in back of you pulls you out of, so that everybody don't have to run the rest of the night. They just pull them out of line. <clears throat> uh, well, anyhow, uh, that was my basic training now. Sterezo is a different word. But it's all also given with an aorist imperative. It is this word sterero, sterazo, means it means to establish, to confirm, or to fix. This is a result when you get into this waiting period. This means you need to focus on the inhale exhale of categorical Bible doctrine no matter uh, to the circumstances no matter how many times the circumstances change. Because this has been established and confirmed and fixed. <clears throat> we, have, we see that very clearly in the life of Joseph in my Tuesday night Bible study, right? The undeserved suffering this guy went through. And, and listen, it, it, he was changing it on him, developing character of leadership uh, for coming attractions. <clears throat> and, of course, then I quoted Philippians 1.29. Here is 2 Timothy 1.12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established, there's our word, in the truth. This word established, notice I wrote it because I thought I'd put it on the paper, and then when I was going over my notes, I didn't. Listen, this is really important, so I wrote it on, your, I wrote it on my paper. <laughs> Perfect passive participle. And you, you'll see that it's a paraphrastic, but... But th that established is a perfect tense, which means in the past, the results or remains completed. Passive voice means this is the voice of grace interacting with the word of God. And it's a participle. This is a participle. And it's a principle. It's a doctrinal principle. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. That's coaching. That's coaching. Right? That's Paul coaching. Pastoring even though you already know them, I'm there to what? Remind you, and having been established, know them, and have been established in the truth which is present in you. He, he applauds them. Keep on keeping on. It's, you're doing it right. You can read more about that uh, in Second Peter. And then Paul, he uses this word, on, on, in missionary work, this word established, he would, go, he would convert people, then go back and establish them in the word. Established in the word. That actual exercise, I laid it out in, in Acts 14, 15, 18, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. All missionary work. ISBE, which is International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, <laughs> You can see why it's called ISBE and nobody writes it out. <clears throat> on page 2263, on this very subject, <clears throat> and this word says about patience, it, about the, this combination of exercises that we've talked about, macro through myo and sterezo. It is the reliance, this patience in long suffering. It is the reliance on God and the acceptance of his will with trust in his goodness, his wisdom, and his faithfulness that we are enabled to endure, to hope steadfastly to the end. And they've hit it right on the head. 
Psalms 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. See, that's that same idea. Yes, I said wait for the Lord. Precious produce. He talks about Job. This is, this is Peter and James. James 5, 10, 11 says it. I, I'm quoting 1 Peter 5, 10. After you have suffered for a little while, now a little while, is a long period sometimes. After you have suffered for a little while, I mean, a little while, God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then James comes back in verse, verses of the fifth chapter 10 and 11, talks about Job in context. See, I was, originally I was going to run this thing all the way to verse 11, but you can see why I didn't, because I've taken up all my time in these two first two verses. I tell you, God really touched my heart in this. And the importance for us to coach up, to coach people. When they call you to pray for them and they're in this kind of sickness, um, I mean, certainly we'll do that, but we also, I mean, there's a good reason why you're, you're on their phone dial. <laughs> it's not just to pray for them. It's to coach them, to help them, to be a good farmer in their life. Uh, so uh, that's what God taught me. Uh, so that's what I'm taking to heart. All right, let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have a short prayer for ourselves. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and the Internet. I pray those who have stepped into the Internet with us tonight, you know people who are suffering, undeserved. You know it, they know it. And sometimes the, the period between the early and latter rains and the precious produce can be a really tough time. They need our prayers. They need our coaching. They need our assistance as a body of Christ. But what they really need is to understand that God chose them because they had good soil and he planted the seed in them. And out of this period between the early and latter rains and the precious produce is going to come great ministry. Go back and read the book of Philippians and see the great ministry that comes out of undeserved suffering. Don't miss this opportunity for Christ when it's been sent to you for that reason. Philippians 1.29 it has been granted by the grace of God. It has been granted for the grace of God to, to be exposed to people around you. Not only to believe, but to suffer for his namesake. Encourage our hearts with this, Father, that we might be good coaches of those going through it because they are the body of Christ. And they have a great opportunity to touch people that we would never touch any other way. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.